Hello, my name is Frank Cohen and I am the Director of Analytics and Business Intelligence for Doctors Management, a healthcare consulting firm out of Knoxville, Tennessee. My areas of expertise are primarily in computational statistics, predictive analytics, and operational research. Today's free webinar is an introduction to risk-based auditing with a bit of a focus on CMS's use of new and advanced fraud detection technologies and what you can do to prepare. In the front end, before an audit occurs, there's a lot of practice can do to get a handle on whether they are at risk, how large a risk uh, there may be, and specifically where the risk is focused. By understanding these three things, a practice can begin to lower the latent risk they face should an audit occur. Now, when the webinar is over, I'm going to present a demo of our Compliance Risk Analyzer and our Audit Tracker applications uh, that can identify compliance risk events for a medical practice by code and by provider and manage your audit process from A to Z. Now, for purposes of transparency, you should know that our system is designed to work best with practices that have more than 50 physicians. Also, you do not have to stick around for this presentation to get your CEUs. However, if you're really interested in ways to become more efficient and to improve your risk-based auditing and audit management capabilities, then I invite you to stick around for a few minutes afterward. A copy of the presentation is available for you now, as is the CEU certificate. This is on an honor system. We expect if you get the certificate, you will stick around for the whole presentation. You can download both of these um, now from the dashboard, and the certificate is good for everyone attending at your location. And I will also give you the certificate number at the end of the presentation as well. Uh, questions will be handled via the questions box on your control panel. Feel free to type in your question at any time. And I'll do my best to answer them in between sections, but we're going to have something like a thousand people on today. So if I don't get to them now, I will go ahead and email you those questions afterward. So let's go ahead and get started. So according to CMF, CMS, they put this out. They said that healthcare fraud is a persistent and costly problem, both for commercial and government payers. The Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services, CMS, estimates that a significant amount of fee-for-service payments are misspent on improper payments every year. To address this healthcare fraud, uh, Congress and CMS have developed a variety of approaches over the past several years to audit Medicare and Medicaid claims. And one of these is called the Fraud Prevention System. So again, here's, so, so basically prior to 2011, um, auditors relied upon arcane techniques like random probe audits or utilization benchmarking to ferret out improper payments. But these methods created so many false positives that it resulted in a really poor return on investment for the payers, right? They didn't want to do that anymore. So in 2011, CMS introduced the Fraud Prevention System, or uh, FPS, which consists of a series of predict uh, predictive analytical algorithms that are designed to identify or target high-risk providers. So beginning July 1st of 2011, 100% of all Medicare fee-for-service claims, including all of yours, are passed through these algorithms prior to payment. And you can see what it says here that in the first three years, they've um, been prevented what they think is close to a billion dollars worth of inappropriate payments. And you got to remember that those are just the monies that you didn't get, not the 2.4 billion or so that were recouped after the fact. Now, uh, prior to, um, um, to, to that point, um, payers were looking for certain issues or problems within the coding cycle. And really, a lot of that hasn't changed. So, for example, they're looking for mistakes, which are made up of just simple errors, right? And, and with the complexity found within the coding guidelines, it's not uncommon to see these errors. They, maybe these are transposed procedure, or diagnosis codes, or computer errors, or incorrect data items, things such as that. Um, the inefficiencies often create financial waste for both the practice and for the payer. Uh, this may be medically unnecessary services, uh, improper diagnosis, or even just regular systematic bad coding and billing practices. 
um, when we get to um, the bending of resources, this often results in accusations of abuse, which really change the game uh, for the provider. Because here we see practices like upcoding, improper referrals, uh, uh, maybe even uses of, of unlicensed or unregistered staff. And when intent can be shown, fraud rears its ugly head. Examples are billing for services that were not provided, uh, maybe unbundling services when it's clear they're not permitted, even as much as altering uh, medical records. But for the most part, fraud accounts for only around 3% of the healthcare uh, spending estimates or fraud estimates. So errors and waste are a lot more difficult to identify. That's why CMS has turned to these more advanced technologies. Now there's five primary areas that the auditors look at. Uh, the first is E&M, and actually everyone's interested in E&M codes. And, and, and one of the reasons is because E&M codes are so easy to audit and to review. But I gotta tell you, my personal experience, I've, been, I've worked on probably close to four or 500 post-audit extrapolation appeals over the years, and E&M codes make up a very small percentage of what the actual overpayment damage estimates are, which feels a bit counterintuitive to a lot of folks. Then you have the non-E&M procedures, utilizations by frequency problems. This is an area where ZPICs really like to get involved because the ZPIC can impose a civil penalty, I think of up to $11,000 for each claim that's reported inappropriately. So they're looking to garner as, as many as they can with regard to the numbers. The RVUs are looked at a lot by private payers and by the RACs. Now, they don't care what your RVU usage is, what you do with your RVUs. What they're looking at is a way to try to estimate costs. So if you're getting a lot of these CBRs, comparative billing reports, that are coming in from, say, the private payers, and they're saying things like your costs are higher than your peers. They're using RVUs um, to assess that. So RACs, private payers, this is a big area for them to review. And then modifiers. Again, modifiers um, uh, tend to be looked at by different groups of auditors and payers. What we've seen here is a change in the and the actual modifiers being reviewed. So we've always had issues with 25s and 59s, but now we're seeing auditors that include modifiers like 24 and 78. I expect this to expand in the near future. Finally, we have the issue of time. Um, time is primarily the purview of the OIG. And what they do is they go out and they look at using the Harvard Ruck time study, which is the same um, database that we use. They're out looking to identify which providers are practicing what they call the medically impossible day. And this occurs normally when the assessed time under the studies exceeds 5,000 hours per year. And the, the beauty of time is that it's agnostic to specialty or procedure. It doesn't care what you do or who you are or what your specialty is. Time is time is time. And if you're exceeding those time limits, it becomes very difficult to justify what you're doing. In doing some research, I came across this great report that was published by CMS on their program integrity efforts. So what it does is it lists the uh, different types of reviews that CMS performs. For example, an automated review is where the computer algorithm processes large numbers of claims and looking for obvious issues, right? Missing demographics or codes or whatever. Um, a semi-automated review is where uh, a person dives into some of the anomalies, right, and, and combines us with the automated review. The complex review is what most of us see, though, and that's where they come in and actually do a chart audit um, on the, um, the client, the chart itself. Now, what I want you to notice is the number of claims in the automated review and that they're very close to the number of claims in the complex review. But I also want you to notice that in the automated review, they were able to recoup or correct $96 million, while in the complex review, it was $2.33 million or billion almost. So what we're seeing is that the complex reviews, even though they're almost the same number as the automated reviews, make up 93% 
of all of the errors that are found, where in the semi-automated and automated only make up for 3% of those. And that's huge, right? So, so we should expect the fact that we're going to have a continued approach and, and an increase in the number of these complex reviews that go on amongst the physician practices. So let's take a look at how this process works. So in the automated reviews, uh, using say the fraud prevention system and maybe other advanced models, individuals as well as groups of claims are scored based on some likelihood that they may have been billed inappropriately. Each of those are assigned an NPI code. And, and when those are kicked out of the system, a human operator uh, gets a hold of those and says, okay, well, let's pull, a, let's pull a limited data set, maybe the last three months or six months of claims for this particular MPI code. And they're going to go ahead and review that and looking for patterns. And if they find those patterns, what they're going to do is they're going to uh, work hard to determine what the expected value would be of an audit. What's it going to cost to do the audit? What's their return on investment going to be? And if, in fact, they find out that it meets those criteria, then they're going to then schedule a focused or a complex review of your practice. That's when you're going to get the letter that says, congratulations, you've been selected to be audited. Send us all the medical records for these 30 or 60 or 100 or whatever it is, number of claims that we've gone ahead and we've pulled. Now, in many cases, and this has happened really lately, about three or four times in the, in the clients that I've worked with, where they were notified of an audit, the client, and then the auditor said, hey, why don't you do it yourself and report to us back the findings? And the question is, why, why would they want you to do that? And the reason is because they saved the money of doing the audit themselves and they figure you're scared enough that no matter what you find, you're going to pick it apart and you're going to send them back potentially more than what they may have been due. So for them, it's a win. And for the practice, it's, it's a win in the sense that, that you don't have to go through the hassle of having an outsider come in and do the audits for you. And I want you to notice that in this case, the trigger was a benchmark against the CERT study, the Comprehensive Error Rate Testing Study, where it said, for example, that 8.5% of those E&M payments were identified as being billed at the wrong level. So we encourage you to conduct your own audit on your own claims and then refund any appropriate um, payments to the MAC. That's what they're basically telling you to do. So let's talk about quickly this idea of what is the CERT or the Comprehensive Error Rate Testing Program. The CERT is a program that was established by OIG and is run through CMS. And what they do is they randomly select some number of claims that were submitted to carriers and fiscal intermediaries and MACs during some reporting period. They, their goal is, it used to be 100,000 claims. Now it's less. It's closer to 50,000 claims. And then they split them up between these groups. And then what they do is when they get the claim, they request the medical record from the healthcare provider. Right? So you're going to get a letter from the CERT saying, please send us the medical records that support this particular claim. Um, they're going to then review the claims in the sample um, uh, against the medical records, right? against the, the, the Medicare coverage rules and coding rules and billing rules and all that. And if there's an error, assign that error to the claim. Now, if you didn't submit a medical record, they're also going to classify that as an error. I think that's unfortunate because in standard practices, it would be considered missing data, but CMS reports it as an error if you don't submit the documentation. And then they'll send you these overpayment letters or notices, or if it was an underpayment, supposedly making adjustments. So they'll send a letter saying either pay us money back or we're going to go ahead and, and adjust this and you're going to get an additional payment for the underpaid amount. So for 2017, which is the last full year that we have uh, the data, what you can see here is that the improper um, payment rates and are, are identified for the Part A, the Part B, the DME uh, point of sale stuff, and then what the overall is. So uh, if we're looking at Part B, for example, we can see that the improper payment rate was 10.2% or, or somewhere between 93 
and 11%. Um, the percent of overall improper payment amounts was 27.2%. Uh, so what this is doing is it's giving you um, an idea of what the improper payment rate looks like, and then CMS uses this to determine what the overpayment dollar amounts might be based on what the total dollars that were paid. They also break it down by improper payment rates by error category. So for example, this is just a pie chart and here's a table that supports it. And it tells you that no documentation was a certain percentage. And what I want you to notice here is that a lot of people that I've talked to coders say, well, you know, the majority of the problems that we face here uh, happened to be with medical necessity. Well, medical necessity only made up 17.5% of all of the causes, and it was insufficient documentation that made up the majority of the overpayment or the inappropriate payment issues. So if you're doing audits, you might want to really think about that. I know medical necessity is important. It's an overarching criteria for what that code's going to be. But when these audits are done, it was improper documentation that caused the majority of the problems. And also I wanted to identify this to people who get confused, that auditors look at a lot more than just EM. People have really been hung up on this. This is one where it's a modifier 25. And interestingly enough, this is E&M codes, but they're not looking at the E&M codes. They're looking at, it, at the practice for an audit of them because their services totaled over 15 hours per day. Remember I told you that the government uses the Harvard Rock Time Study to assess the number number of minutes to a procedure times the frequency gives you the number of hours. And they're saying, for example, this provider was providing e &M services over 15 hours per day. Uh, that's one of the ways that the RAC got around the prohibition on auditing e &M codes several years ago was by coming in through the back door. Now, if we're going to be looking at our audit risk, we, we also have to look at the OIG work plan because the OIG work plan is important with regard to what the government might be looking at with regard to audit. So we can see here physician billing for critical care and E&M services, uh, Medicare Part B outpatient cardiology and pulmonology rehab services, um, intensity modulated radiation therapy, uh, psychotherapy services, high use of outpatient services, prolonged services. You can get this plan, I believe they publish it every month now. And for each of these, it takes you to the website. And what the website will do is give you a more detailed view of what the reasons are for those particular problems so that you can address those in advance, a priori, and, and deal with those risk issues in advance, uh, thereby mitigating the risk that you would face when an audit occurs. The other thing I wanted to show you was this concept of how risk accumulates. So if you have risk in different areas, maybe it's time and frequency and RVU, those risk components accumulate and it builds your risk profile even higher. I just wanted to show you an example. These are the top 10 things that uh, IRS looks for the top 10 reasons for an IRS audit. So obviously making an error in your return is one of them. Uh, claiming deductions for a home office is, is another one, or high charitable contributions, or being paid in cash, or even just making a lot of money or driving a lot. But think about what happens to your risk if you have an error in your return and you had deductions for a home office and you had high charitable contributions and you're making a lot of money your risk increases for an audit. And it's the same thing when we're looking at how those risk events occur within the practice. So what we wanna do now is we wanna build the audit plan for the provider. We wanna look at some quantitative methods to determine how do we assess where those risk events are occurring for the practice. Now the audit plan, in my opinion, and I guess if you're a uh, compliance specialist, you certainly welcome to disagree with this, but particularly for physician practices, I think the goal of the compliance plan is really this creation of an audit plan because the audit plan is what drives the compliance plan in the end. It, it is this concise document. It's a workbook, a spreadsheet, a, um, a ledger or something like that that tells you for each physician 
which procedure codes and modifiers are going to be subject to an internal review. I'll talk about some of the methods for this in a minute. And, and remember, we saw this before and we're seeing this now in current audits, that CMS and the private payers are expecting that you're going to self-audit your, your coding and billing on a regular basis. And this is part of the 60-day rule and the look-back periods, the, the paybacks, the self-disclosure rules. They expect that you're going to go ahead and you're going to reimburse those funds when you find that they've been paid in error. Without that audit plan, the compliance plan just kind of sits on the shelf. It's a policy and procedural binder or manual. It's Again, my opinion, you're welcome to disagree with me on this, but from our perspective, what we're looking at here, that audit plan drives what we're going to do with compliance moving forward. So the next question is getting ready to perform the audit, right? So knowing what to audit is critical, knowing how to audit is imperative. Let's look at a couple ways that we might be able to identify potential risks. So the first thing is, a lot of practices up until, you know, four or five years ago, till the fraud prevention system came out, really relied upon probe audits. And probe audits are just these old, archaic ways to do it. And it's my opinion as a statistician, and again, you know, please feel free to disagree, but those random probe audits, when you don't know in advance where the issues are, are absolutely worthless. Because let's say I have a physician, an internal medicine physician, and this physician does a hundred different things, right? Unique procedures. And I pull 10 encounters as an audit. Even if I was lucky enough to get one of each of those, I would now only have 10% of what that physician did um, accounted for or represented. And for each one, I'd only have one, which isn't enough in order to do a review. If you're going to do probe audits, you got to pull literally a thousand charts per year for every provider. So another way people do it is by frequency comparison. So they may take, for example, the Medicare database and look at the most often reported procedure for this specialty, let's say is 99213. And it's also the number one reported for this provider, but this provider does it 19, almost 20% more often than his or her peers do, right? 13% is national, this provider's at 16%. Here's another one. Uh, this is the ninth most often reported procedure, diagnostic colonoscopy, I guess it's probably a GI doc. And for this practice, it's number four. This provider does it more than twice as often as his or her peer group. So one way you can do this is you can take the count and you can multiply it times the variance for each of these, you'll get a number. Now, the number doesn't mean anything just yet, but you do this for every single one of these where there's a positive variance. And then what you do is you take the one that the ones that have the highest um, result, the highest product of these multiplication issues here of the, the count times the variance, and those become your highest priority. So in this case, it, it almost lines up. I would do this procedure first, then audit this one, then this one, then this one, and then if I still have time and resources left, I would do this one. Because what we're trying to do is at least pick the top five when we do it. So the other question is how many charts do I need to review? Well, we talked about a probe audit. And without that a priori risk assessment, dozens if not hundreds or a thousand or more charts per provider. If you audit afterwards, if, if we've already identified risk, then you need a much smaller sample, just a few charts. Because, and we don't have time to get into this, but sampling methodology just says that the higher the homogeneity or the similarity of the variables within that set, the smaller the sample. And if we have some group of procedures for a particular physician, it's easy to assume that those have been coded pretty much the same way all the time. One given procedure for a given provider, no matter who's coding it, likely does it using the, a standard or even a similar algorithm. Now, if it's a high risk event, we say look at five. If it's a low risk event, maybe look at three. So let's say that if three out of the five are improper, look at five more. 
Now you've done 10. If six out of the 10 are improper, then maybe then is when you want to do a statistically valid random sample, pull 30, and expect the fact that you may have to do a payback. But it's my opinion, again, as a statistician, that it is never necessary to pull a statistically valid random sample unless you suspect a pattern of improper payments. So unless you think there's a problem, and remember, in a self-disclosure audit, there's a high bar. You have to suspect fraud or abuse if you're doing self-disclosure. So most people don't have to do these, or if they do them, they may be doing them in error. It's very important to note that. If you pull a, a statistically valid random sample and you find a pattern, then you may have just subjected yourself to a look back and extrapolation. So what I'm gonna do now is I'm gonna show you some of the forms that, this is what we use in our system. You don't have to use these, you can do it any way you want. But this is just some of the forms that we use to make it quick for the provider. So, you know, let's say it was a 99214 and they do their audit, and these are all drop downs. You can click on these and you can pick from those which of the, of the um, levels it's supposed to be. And then you can add the codes in. So here, let's say it was a 215, and it was supposed to be a 214, and there were medical decision-making problems, and there was an incorrect date of service, and the place of service was wrong, and the exam was wrong. It's just somewhere where you can log all of the issues and the problems that you're having. If it's a non-E&M code, it's pretty much the same thing, except you're not going to have the key components. And so it makes it a little faster and a little more efficient that you can go in and... Um, identify all these potential issues. And then what I do is I calculate pass-fail rates. So for each provider, I look at the total number of charts or encounters that were reviewed, and I'm interested in two things. What was the pass rate on medical necessity? What was the pass rate on documentation criteria? And when you add it together, what was the pass rate for both? And then what I want to know is how many total issues did I find for that a particular specialty or that provider or whatever it is that I'm analyzing at the time. It's also important to define what uh, constitutes a pass-fail event. So like some of our folks, let's say they're doing claims. If just one of the line items fails, they'll consider the claim to have failed. Others will do that on a line-by-line -line or encounter basis and say, no, only that line failed. Um, some people may say if there's any issue at all, if, if there's an attestation that's missing or modifier problem in position three, that constitutes a fail as well. And others will go, no. You know, we even have some clients that if the E&M error is um, only one level, um, then they don't consider that to be a fail either. So you have to define how that works for you. And then define what you're going to do. So let's say that... Uh, the provider has a 90% pass rate, uh, you audit annually. If it's uh, 75 or 80 to 90, you do it quarterly. If it's um, um, 60 to 75, maybe you do it monthly. And if it's below 60%, maybe you do 100% pre-bill audit. These are internal issues that should be dealt with within your compliance plan. The provider audit report um, is the next logical step. This is a detailed report that you would take to the provider in order to do education and remediation services with them. So again, you can see what that looks like here. Um, this was a five, it should have been a four. Uh, medical decision-making is moderate. There was no severe exacerbation. So you're just going through and doing the education. And then you wanna create a workflow. And the workflow says, okay, now I've done all these audits. Now I've assigned when the re-audit's gonna be done. Some are a year, some are three months, some are a month, some are pre-bill audit. These are when those next assignments are set to go. And then once the second set of audits or third set of audits have been done, what becomes really important is to start to trend the pass-fail rate. So what you're doing here is you're, recre you're creating a return on investment. You're spending all this money on education, remediation, and training of the physicians. What we want to know is, did they get better or did they get worse? You know, so here's a provider that uh, the first period was at 100%. Now they're at 87.5. Here's one that was at 50%. And the next two periods, they went to 100. So all you're doing is measuring how your providers are responding to training. And those that are um, incalcitrant or serial offenders or resistant to learning, you can identify those as well. And the final step is to create analytics. This is just a couple of examples of the analytics that I like to look at. This tells me, you know, the biggest problem was incorrect 
uh, procedure code, followed by e and over coding by one level, followed by medical decision making, um, followed by some other issue, and you know, 15 is the exam. And then you could go through and look at those individually, one at a time, for each of the providers. And that concludes our presentation. I want to thank you very much for your time in reviewing this. If you have any questions, you can certainly write to me or call me. If you want to see more about our system, you can go to compliancerisanalyzer.com. And thank you again.